Welcome back to Reality Asserts Itself on the Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay. We're continuing our interview series with Kamal Franklin. Thanks for joining us again. One more time, Kamal works with the American Friends Service Committee, which is a Quaker social justice organization, and was involved with the Malcolm X grassroots movement and much more. And his whole bio is down below the video player here. So we're going to pick up on some, another big question facing the movement today, which is the, the relationship between what's called movement building mm -hmm. and what's called having an electoral strategy or participating in elections. Mm -hmm. And there seems to be a kind of Chinese wall between the two things for a lot of people, mm -hmm. uh, which is especially a lot of people who in the movement building side, and I guess that means different things to different people movement building, think mm -hmm. electoral strategy, is a distraction, you can't really accomplish anything, and one way or the other you wind up being assimilated into the Borg, the Borg being the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. What's your take? I think they're mistaken, um, just to be clear. I, I, I think that you have to have an electoral strategy because uh, those resources matter. They matter to how communities function. When you think about the money that municipalities have, that counties have, that states have, if you just decide to not do anything in that arena, you are sacrificing probably 75% of the movement that you could potentially be building to someone else. If you don't think that uh, changing how people enact policies and how resources are distributed in a community, then I think you've made a huge mistake. And I think sometimes people don't want to get their hands dirty. Uh, and I, I think that sometimes people will say, sort of from the outside looking in, that uh, any sort of attempt to build, uh, particularly locally, and use the Democratic Party as something that you have to build within is some sellout, and that they have this imaginary, in my opinion, imaginary idea that you're gonna just create a third party uh, and then it's just gonna be able to sort of take control or, or win people over and come to sort of some sort of fruition of, of winning power. And unfortunately, I don't think in America, the, I think the two parties are so established, and particularly on a local level, there are openings, and I think in Jackson we proved in some ways that there were openings within a local democratic structure which doesn't necessarily take its, its orders from the national party. Local democratic structures uh, in the short term become viable places. Democratic party structures. Democratic party structures. So we're talking Jackson, Mississippi. Yeah. So quickly tell us what happened. Uh, well, in Jackson, you know, uh, we had to convince Shokwe at first to run for political office. He was, he was uh, actually opposed to it. He didn't want to be involved in electoral politics. And he, was a, he was a very prominent lawyer. Very prominent lawyer, advocate. He was, the, he was well known as a uh, sort of a lawyer who would defend the defenseless. Uh, he was well known as an organizer who would take up causes that no one else wanted to take on. Uh, just in terms of spending time in Jackson, you could see how people would come up to Shokwe and whisper in his ear. It's like, I heard what you said on TV, I really support you, and this would leave, and you would not, you would not see them again. Uh, but I think when Shokwe ran for city council, our first thought was that we were going to be building sort of a... Uh, I'm not sure we said it. This is Shokwe Lumumba. Shokwe Lumumba, I'm sorry. That we would be building a, a sort of apparatus to strengthen what we wanted to do in Jackson, that we didn't think we would necessarily win. Folks in Jackson, to their credit, I wasn't there at the time, actually put together a campaign strategy and plan that won that office. Uh, and later on, I think Shokwe got the bug to say, hey, I think there are things we can accomplish through this electoral strategy. And he, more than anybody, wanted to run for mayor. In the first six months uh, of the his mayor race, I was his campaign manager. In the last six months, I had left the organization because we just had differences of opinion around how resources should be spent and how other things should happen. But I think in spite of that, that Shokwe Lumumba was going to win. He didn't need me to win the mayorship of Jackson, Mississippi. I think to our detriment or to the detriment of the organization, however, the organization wasn't prepared outside of this individual, important, charismatic person to sort of do other things in Jackson. So and for those who haven't followed the story, Chokwe uh, died of a heart attack. Mm -hmm. how, how long into being and, mayor? Uh, eight months into being year, and in fact, uh, I think uh, a couple of days ago represented the year anniversary of his death. And afterwards, his son ran to take, but lost the, the, the following election. Yeah, right? exactly, which I, and, and I, I think fits into the issues that was never, was never resolved in terms of what the Jackson plan was supposed to be. Uh, it's the economic plan. The, the economic plan and the plan around uh, uh, building outside political apparatuses 
that could withstand this, this particular individual or any individual uh, either not being in office uh, and not probably in Shokwe's case, but in anybody's case who, who if they get into these political positions and they may falter around what their policy should be, if you don't have an outside organization that has a base of support that can say, in spite of the pressures that you're getting, we're gonna push you further left. We were not able, when I was down there, to sort of construct what that outside organization should look like. We did start, or, or people did start doing what was called the People's Assemblies, which were supposed to represent a broader politic for Jackson, Mississippi, and not just the Malcolm X grassroots movement. But I think what I found was that the sort of love that people had for Shokwe, and I think this bared itself out through the election campaign of his son, was not just transferable. Right? If, if we didn't take the time or if people didn't take the time to build the apparatuses needed on the outside so that they became real places for political power outside of the established order, then, as you saw, those we would lose the election and, we, and folks did lose the election. So I think the, what's happening now in terms of the work that's happening, there's an organization called Cooperative Jackson which is trying to do that now. And I think there's still, folks are still trying to figure out how to build the people's assemblies. So the, I, I, the idea mm -hmm. is how do you create, you, they used to call it an extra parliamentary movement mm -hmm. that has candidates. Exactly, yeah. The, yeah, and, and at some point also to build, even though I sort of shooed away sort of third party uh, um, ideas, but at some point through this process, to build outside of the Democratic Party and potentially now, to build a third party. Was Jackson done through the primary process of the Democratic Party? Yeah, when we, when we came to, down to the decision around whether to run Shokwe within the Democratic Party or to run him as a third party candidate or a third political party candidate, we decided that victory was at hand and that if you, uh, Shokwe Lumumba was an older gentleman who had this chance because again, of his, his relationship, his personal relationship to the community and the MXGM was an extension of that, but it wasn't necessarily, again, transferable. That the better part was to take this opportunity to win and to build from within. So uh, I know you know some of the activists in Ferguson, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of, I think, a lot of discussion, debate, what to do about the electoral politics in Ferguson. You have an all-white city council, and they're the ones giving marching orders, more or less, to the police department. So if you want to mitigate the police department, one would think you need to do something yeah. about city council, but most of the, if I understand it correctly, most of the activists do not want anything to do with electoral politics. There's an all-white city council, basically. There's a, it's a white mayor and it's a white police chief. Uh, and some will say, like, putting a black face in front of, and to replace those white faces uh, may not make a difference. Well, we I have would, that in Baltimore. Yeah. We have a black city council. A black mayor, yeah. majority black city council, but I would, a black mayor, yeah. and a pretty, not a very, and a black police commissioner, yeah. and not the most wonderful police force. But again, I would disagree with them, right? Because I think that the pressure that you can put on black people who will make promises to get those, those places are more than what you can do to the white folks who feel like they're not beholden to that vote anyway. And it's a majority, Ferguson is a majority black city, right? There's but isn't it also, it's not just about some black faces getting on city council, it's about an electoral strategy for a movement and getting progressive black yes. faces yeah. on city council. Which I think is a struggle that has to be taken up. And even if uh, folks are sort of so disgusted with the, what they see as the political apparatus, again, if you leave that open, then you leave so much resources on the table. You leave so much changes that you can happen on the table and you just give it away to somebody who will do nothing with it. There's no, the police chief has not been fired. There has been no change in the mayor, no change in the sort of political structure. As much pressure as folks have put on from the outside, it's, it still has not sort of made these folks sort of shy and go away. And they haven't built the apparatus necessary to run folks for, and run proper candidates to take these, these offices. I think it's part and parcel to any larger struggle. Well, the, the, the counter argument would, would point to Wisconsin, where you had this big movement of public sector workers and, and with a lot of public support, with mass protests occupying the state legislature and so on. Then the recall campaign comes, which becomes an electoral campaign. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the activists at the time were saying, you know, don't get involved in this recall campaign. In fact, don't even do one because it's going to take all, set, suck all the energy out of the protest movement building. Mm -hmm. It became an or, like you either do the movement or you do the, can the recall. Now, the recall forces won in a sense that most people got 
mobilized. They lost the recall, mm -hmm. and they kind of lost the whole thing. They never got the protest movement back again, and now the unions have been kind of broken, and you know, the power of the unions in Wisconsin has been terribly undermined. But I think they were left with little choice. If they, if they didn't do the recall, it, it wasn't as if uh, this, this governor was going to fade away anyway. He had four years. He had the majority of Republicans on, on, in the legislative seats. So that, that was a fixture. So why not try something different that hadn't been tried for a very long time in terms of recalling a governor uh, in Wisconsin or any state, right? This is not something that happens every day. You have to try these electoral strategies, even if you don't think they're gonna be, the, the victory is not gonna be there. If you don't try them again, you still get the same thing that's happening. He's still in place. He's won another election, which well, speaks larger to the other discussion we were having around which way forward for the white working class, right? So he could not have continually won and had a majority Republican one without some change in the thinking and the, I guess, the aspirations of the white working class in Wisconsin. Well, and the other thing too is, I, and I wasn't in Wisconsin and maybe it just wasn't possible, but there needed, I think, to be a big fight with who's going to lead the recall campaign. Mm -hmm. If you're gonna turn the recall electoral strategy over to the Democratic Party apparatchai, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. then yeah, you're yeah. gonna you're gonna wind up, even if you win the recall, what exactly are you gonna get? Mm -hmm. And in the course of it, you're not gonna have a movement left. Mm -hmm. Uh, but maybe the conditions weren't there, but it seems to me that was the next fight is the movement needs to lead this recall campaign and fight over who the candidates are going to be. Yeah. And, I, th and I, th I think you're exactly right. Again, I, th I think that the, the struggle in Wisconsin and in several other places around what's going to happen with these right wing uh, uh, regressive uh, do Republican dominated governors and legislative apparatuses, it can't be left to the Democratic Party. Right? You can push the Democratic Party and you can push some folks within the party, but unless you sort of bubble up and, and figure out new candidates who have progressive credentials, who can be held accountable to the people who put them in those places. take over the local apparatus. Yeah, and if you don't do that, again, if you see that ground, then I think you've left a lot on the table without even trying. It probably depends, you know, especially if you're talking at a city level what the strategy might be. I mean, maybe in some cities it could be a third party, a green party or something that springs out of the municipal history. But uh, in other places, maybe it's a fight in the Democratic Party primaries. But, it's, but, but still, the, the, most of the movement activists that have come up, both in Occupy and out of Ferguson and, and associated things, they, they seem to think anything to do with electoral politics is just going to make them prisoners mm -hmm. of the Democratic Party and they won't have anything to do with it. Yeah. And, I, and I, you know, I think logically, when someone traces the history, there is some sense that, that is made of that, right? But it's almost like having pure politics without pure action. So just because you decide to not operate in this area, it doesn't mean it's not gonna exist. And I think that's unfortunately what's happened. People have sort of talked themselves out of an area of struggle. Because um, again, they think that they are uh, intellectually too pure in some ways to get their hands dirty and to struggle in that, in that apparatus or in some apparatus that changes who's in power as far as, again, millions and in some cases billions of dollars are decided in terms of where it goes, who gets it, who gets tax breaks, what gets zones, where do, where do, what happens with public schools, what happens in terms of charter schools. If we seed all of that ground, and as you can see, in most cities where we've actually seeded that ground or we haven't brought in progressive candidates to make, those, to make some kind of change or do something, we've lost a lot. Well, it also, I think, has to do with focusing too much on the police. I mean, I think we should stop calling them police and call them law enforcement officers, which they like being called anyway. But it stresses the fact that they're there to enforce a set of laws that reinforces fundamentally unjust social, political, economic relationships. They enforce those laws. If you don't change the laws, you're not really going to change the cops. Maybe you can mitigate it a bit. You can get them to be not quite so abusive. You know, you, you know, you, you can nibble around the edges of the thing, but as long as they are enforcing laws that reinforce injustice, the police are going to be what they are. I agree, but I think the dilemma with that is that the, uh, again, particularly I'm not in the black, not to mitigate. Yeah, I'm no, just, I, I'm just I mean, saying mitigating the, is better than nothing. Yeah, but the dilemma for folks who the the person that they most interact with who represents the state are the police, and so it's hard to leave that alone and think that. You're going to skip over that. Oh, I'm not saying skip over it, yeah. but I would, you know, if you want to 
blame the Iraq war, it, if you're an Iraqi, you got to fight American soldiers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. On the other hand, you know who sent them there. Mm -hmm. So, and, and no, I, and it's a little I, different here because yeah, the, yeah. the people sending them there are here. They're not, mm -hmm. you know, Yeah, and again, if you give the up the electoral strategy, I agree, then you don't change larger policies. But I think it becomes, I, I mean, I think the getting at the police issue can become a larger strategy for other things that ail the community. And I think it's traditionally sometimes been used as such. And I think, so focusing in on police issues can, if done smartly, lead to bigger and other changes in terms of sort of progressive challenges to what's happening. So uh, I think one way in which some of that is happening is there's some groups that I'm talking to, you know, we did this uh, event in January trying to bring several groups across the country together to talk around police violence. And we're thinking about doing something similar again in May that talks not only about police violence, but economic justice, right? So I think when you bring issues together, larger issues and try to figure out strategies to let folks know that this leading arm of the state is not the only way in which it interacts with you. And, and again, I, I agree, as, as you said, if you don't, again, get involved in electoral politics in some way, you don't get your hands dirty, you've ceded so much ground. Yeah, I mean, I, I, we're agreeing with each other, yeah. but, but, <laughs> but the issue of you know, civilian management boards of police with the ability to hire and fire police chiefs, uh, uh, real accountability for cops with state attorneys that actually charge cops with, with crimes. Uh, I mean, all of that is a necessary thing, and, 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 but I, I just think that too much into the conversation is limited to just being good cop, bad cop. Mm -hmm. And we need to talk about the laws that they are enforcing is the fundamental thing that creates these great sections of, for example, Baltimore, where we are, mm -hmm. of horrible chronic poverty that goes on for years and years and years and nothing changes. And again, I think you're correct. I just think that when, when your day-to-day -day existence gets jeopardized because you are stopped in the street and you are potentially arrested and harassed and or beat up and killed, your first angle into challenging the state will be police violence as, as young black folks. Yeah, sure. And that has to be a battle that's taken on, but it has to be taken on with some larger objectives attached to it. Because if you only want to change a police commissioner, right, then you're just left with a new face in, in charge of there. But I think if you take on that battle knowing, and as in Ferguson, that there are should be additional battles, right? There should be battles that brings resources into the community. There should be battles that says resources which should be going to the community should be redirected towards the community. And that can only happen through some sort of electoral strategy. If you leave that, if you leave that alone, then those folks will always have that power over you. And we will still be coming back one year later, two years later, three years later, because there will still be these atrocities that happen where somebody is taken out and killed and that becomes the public face of the battle. Okay, much more to talk about, which we'll, we'll do in another session. Mm -hmm. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. And thank you for joining us on Reality Asserts Itself on the Real News Network.